Thank you. Um, I, uh, I was like, embarrassed to discover that you, my, my dirty secret about crashing drones in the national labs, I, uh, the forgiveness I, I sought was, um, I blamed my children. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they weren't going to lock them up. Um, it's a privilege uh, to be here, a uh, privilege to, to follow um, Eric as well. And I think actually the theme of permissionless innovation has turned out to be something that both the uh, Vince Cerf and, and, and Eric and I, and I are going to talk about. Um, uh, this theme, which I'm going to bring up later, of ask, ask uh, forgiveness, not permission, is, um, is absolutely crucial. Um, as, as you've heard before, you know, if Airbnb had asked if they were a hotel, they would have been told yes, and they wouldn't be here. If Uber was asked if they were a, a taxi cab service, they would have been told yes, and they wouldn't be here. And if we had asked if we were an aerospace company, we would have been told yes, and I wouldn't be here. So we didn't ask. Um, so I'm going to tell you a, a little bit of a, of, of a story of the kind of accidental founding of, a, of an aerospace company and end with some, some, uh, some lessons which I think are, are relevant. Um, actually, before I start, I just want to say that um, um, my wife and I have been here in, in the Netherlands for uh, about three days and we got an opportunity to visit the Maritime, the new Maritime Museum in Amsterdam, which was, I guess, read out a few years ago. Uh, not only is it, I think, the, one of the best museums in the world, it's absolutely spectacular, but it's also um, a tribute and a lens to entrepreneurship in the Netherlands. The, what you see there is the story of creating industries, global trade, even um, cartography. Um, uh, this is all created by entrepreneurs in, in the Netherlands, Amsterdam um, in, in particular. Obviously, the Dutch East India Trading Company is the, is a, created the concept of a company. So the spirit of entrepreneurship is extremely strong here. Um, one of the themes of the conference we were at was the founder's spirit. And the problem is that the founders of these original companies uh, died in around 1640. Um, so, so we've lost a little of that, that founder's spirit, but I'm, I'm sure it can be resurrected. And as I say, it's a, it's a privilege to be here amongst you all and seeing so much energy and so many good ideas. Um, what I'm going to show you here is the exact opposite of that. Um, this is... This is uh, this is my, uh, well, you've already heard about my, my, my own history from physicist to, to, uh, to, to editor. But I'm actually going to st start here with, um, uh, with the real uh, secret of how I got started with this particular company. Um, I have five children, and uh, we live in Silicon Valley, and my children, uh, my wife and our, our scientist is trained as scientists, and I'm constantly trying to get the children interested in science and technology. And it is really hard to do that. Um, kids especially these Silicon Valley kids have seen everything, and it's very hard to impress them. But um, in 2007, I was, um, as editor you know, of a magazine, we, we, uh, we got all these products in for review, and um, the new LEGO Mindstorms NXT kit came out. Has anyone here used LEGO Mindstorms? Terrific, okay. Um, you probably use it with your children. Did your children love it, or did they, do they, were they kind of actually not that impressed? Um, but how many people's children absolutely loved it? Okay, few, how many children were not as impressed as you expected? Yeah, that, that was kind of our experience as well. Um, so this is my daughter, Erin. She was about, you know, seven or eight or something like that. And, and you, you just have to build this robot. And it's, he spends all morning building it. And when you're done, it rolls very slowly to a wall and then it backs away. And she's and there. You can see my son d doing that, and they're like, "Dad, we've seen Transformers, right? <laughs> Where are the lasers? I was kind of expecting this walking killing machine. Um, just not that impressive. Um, so, so they. Um, I was kind of annoyed because I thought it was really cool, but that, but they um, they had a high bar, and so I I thought, what would be a cooler robot? And I thought. Flying robot, that would be cool. And I like literally Googled flying robot, and the first result was drone. And I thought, okay, yeah, I guess a drone is a flying robot. And I Googled drone, and the first result was autopilot. And I'm like, okay, I get it, sort of the brain for the plane. And then I Googled autopilot, and there was a lot of stuff about math and, and, and sensors and such. And I said, you know what, kids, let's just do it. Let's just build a drone on the dining room table. And so, um, and so like, this is what happens when you Google drone. You come up with autopilot and you've got a Lego set in front of you, is that you end up creating sort of what looks like the right parts. Those are sensors on the top, and accelerometers, gyroscopes, uh, compasses, um, the, you know, the Lego uh, controller. And we stuck it in a plane, and um, it fit kind of weirdly. It was, I think it was the, like the, the heavens were speaking to us, that it fit just perfectly in the plane. 
And we took it to the, uh, the, uh, the nine-year-old did the programming. Um, and um, we took it to the field, and it's, it worked. I mean, it didn't really work very well, but it, it didn't crash. It did fly. And um, I got chills. Uh, the kids were like, whatever, ice cream. And I was like, that should totally not be possible. It should not be possible for a dad and his kids to do what's essentially a military-grade drone around with toy parts on the dining room table. What just happened here? And, um, you know, I was an editor of Wired, right? I've seen a lot of technologies. I don't get chills very often. I got chills when Tim Berners-Lee first, you know, showed the web. That was, that was a moment. Um, and, this, <laughs> and this was another one. I was like, something in this world has changed. It should, you know, it was like a, you know, if you just indulge my geek, my geek analogies, it was like a disturbance in the force or a glitch in the matrix. You know, some signal propagated out into the universe and, and said, you know, the world has changed, it's up to you to figure out how. So um, what I do, and I think probably many of you do, is that you sort of, you go online and you ask dumb questions. And I created a, a website essentially to ask dumb questions like what is going on with this stuff. And I called it DIY drones kind of as a joke because drones at, the point, at that point were military weapons and DIY was not. And I just thought putting the two together would be funny. Um, and, uh, and the great thing that happens when you ask stupid questions in public is that A, people answer your questions, and B, it liberates other people to ask their own stupid questions. And this is one of those moments where everybody was new to some element of this. Um, and so what we realized is that 2007, and this was the year, 2007 was the sort of the dawning of the new hardware renaissance. It was the year that a bunch of things happened. Um, in, in our case, it was open source computing with Arduino. Uh, the 3D printing, consumer 3D printing movement started with the RepRap project here, here in uh, Europe. Actually, interestingly, both of those are European. Uh, the maker movement started with Make Magazine and the maker fairs. Um, if any of you have a Fitbit, um, the wearable activity tracker, that started because the, um, the Wii controller, the Wii video game was released that year and the controller um, amazed these guys who were just like, what's in here that makes that cursor move? And it was an accelerometer. And they're like, what else could it do? And that's the thing. For us, it was, it was the Lego Mindstorms. Um, but the real thing, of course, was the iPhone. That was the year of the iPhone. <coughs> and inside that iPhone were a set of enabling technologies, MEM sensors, GPS, cameras, ARM core processors, wireless stacks, power management, those technologies were suddenly accelerating faster than any, tech, any Moore's Law progress in history. And those technologies, not only, and they were because of the economies of scale of Apple and Google and LG and the others, those technologies were not only enabling these extraordinary devices in our pockets, but also a bunch of adjacent industries. And we could now, those of us outside, could take one of those chips, one of those sensor chips, and build a flying robot. Which is, which is what we did. So um, build the community. The community starts developing technologies, software, hardware, et cetera, very quickly innovating faster than any of the, any of the you know, military industrial uh, companies, any of the aerospace companies. They're, they're, this is open source. It's total crowdfunding. Or crowd, it wasn't even funding, it was just crowdsourcing. Um, but, and it was extraordinary, but it was all just sort of just files on the internet. And the next generation comes along and they say, that's amazing, but I don't know how to compile code. I don't know how to fab a PCB. Can I just buy one? Can you like sell a kit? So here's our first production line. Um, when you said the company started in 2009, I, I think you have to define company somewhat loosely. Um, so um, so uh, a couple key bits to, to see here. First of all, um, uh, the parts are Lego, um, uh, except the stuff in the box which are all these um, uh, motors and electronic components that um, I had um, sourced from China. W w what does that mean? And the answer is, I kind of, you know, I'd lived in China for four years. I'd seen the way, you know, it used to be that you would get factories in China to work for you, and you have to fly to Hong Kong, Hong Kong, get a handler, and get, you know, visit factories, get a letter of credit, to, you know, bank transfers. But by the time I was doing this, we had Alibaba. And I just went online, and I sort of said, I want a motor. And you know, look for motors, and I found found sites that sold motors, and I was like, okay, I'd like to buy some motors. And then like, what kind of motors would you like? And I like, what do you have? And I'm like, what would you like? And I'm like, I just want a motor. And they said, design it. 
I'm like, I don't know anything about motors. And they're like, here's a little form to fill out about, about windings and shaft lengths and magnets. And I was like, okay, check, check, check. And they're like, great, how many would you like? And I was like, 50? And they're like, well, we could sell you 50, but it's kind of expensive. If you buy 5,000, they'll be much cheaper. And I'm like, how much cheaper? And they're like, 20 cents each. And I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty good. And I'm like, okay, fine, now, now it's time to pay. I'm gonna have to do the bank transfer letter. And they're like, PayPal or credit card? PayPal? And I said, okay, we'll do PayPal. And uh, 10 days later, this box of custom fabricated motors shows up. And I just realized that I'd got robots in China to work for me and they took PayPal. <laughs> uh, that was, that was the, like, the next moment that I got chills. I was like, Stum okay, this is the other big thing. The global supply chain is completely reshaped. When you can now get factories in China to work for you by tapping out on your keyboard and, and, and handing over, you know, a few bucks in PayPal, that's enabling. So um, that's what's in the cardboard box, is those bits. Um, we paid the children with strawberries, as you can see, um, and juice. Um, what we made was this, it was a robot blimp, um, based on Arduino, so thus the incredibly creative name, blimp, you know. Um, those are pizza boxes. Uh, we learned some important lessons about, um, about business. Um, important lesson number one, if you sell out, you have to make more. I realize that's probably not even a college degree for this, but um, the problem with having, with A, we sold out instantaneously. The problem with having to make more is that I couldn't get the kids to do it again. <laughs> I just couldn't spin up the production line again. It was just like, I'd already maxed out the whole strawberries and juice thing. Um, so I was like, oh no, my company's done. You know, our, our factory just dissolved from playing video games. Um, what am I going to do? And so I, I went back to our community and I said, um, is there anybody who would help me and like make these things for me? And so this guy here, Jordi Munoz, who I'd never met, but it was just, he'd, he'd shared these videos of him playing, you know, flying a helicopter with a Wii controller, seemed super smart. Um, and I said, I, would you make some boards for me? And he said, sure. And he says, um, I'll need, uh, I'll need uh, $500 for parts. I was like, oh, that's a, all right, well, this better get big, this company. I'm gonna... So I sent, him, I sent him 500 bucks, and he sent me back this picture. And I was pretty impressed. I mean, he's got a table. Um, like he had like a much better soldering iron than me. Um, and uh, so I was, I was feeling pretty good about this, and I was like, okay, we're done. The company is now, is now you know, fully, fully operational. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm the editor of, of Wired, so that was, that was the end of that. Uh, but he kept sending me these pictures. He says, look, we've got a new space. And I thought to myself, shelves, I'm super pro. Um, and uh, there's a, one of the women to the right is a bookkeeper, which I thought was kind of impressive, impressive as well. And then he said, okay, um, we've got a new space. Um, this time, he said, we bought pick and place machines, um, used ones from e uh, eBay, and uh, stencil printers and reflow ovens and some CNC machines. And I'm like, what? I don't even know what these are. I'm Googling very quickly pick and place machine. It turns out it's a robot that makes, puts chips on, on printed circuit boards. And um, they just, he just downloaded the instructions from Google. Um, and set up this uh, yeah, okay, decent electronics factory. And I thought, well, that's super impressive. I still haven't met the guy. Um, and then he says, and now we started a second factory in Tijuana, Mexico. Um, this is the clean room facility. I, I, they have smocks with our logo um, on it, which I thought was super impressive. And then it turns out that, um, that they've actually been really good about, um, about uh, production quality. And so they, uh, one, thing, one of the things you have to worry about is electrostatic discharge. And so the workers have these um, cables uh, that connect them um, to the machines to ensure that they uh, don't uh, shock the, the parts. And I showed this to my friends, and they're like, chain your workers to the machines? <laughs> so, so cool. Um, and then he sent me another picture, and he says, we've scaled up the Tijuana factory now, in addition to our San Diego factory. And at this point, I thought it would probably be a good idea to meet him. Um, so um, the company uh, was now doing, um, I think it was, was on track to do $7 million in revenues. Um, it had been funded with $500 of, of investment capital. I hadn't met my, my co I hadn't met him yet. Uh, so I went down to meet him, and it turns out that when I met him, he was a, um, he was a teenager, a Tijuana teenager. Um, he uh, was 19. Um, he'd actually been in the United States because his girlfriend uh, was pregnant, and he wanted uh, her to give birth in the United States so the baby could have American citizenship. So that's... That's why he was available to work for me, because he, was, he wasn't allowed to work until he got his green card. Um, so, um, 
There's a couple, now normally, if the editor of Wired is going to start a 21st century aerospace company, you normally wouldn't pick a, a Tijuana teenager you met on the internet. Um, but this turned out to be perfect, the perfect way to do it, because a couple things. First of all, teenagers just get the web. They just understand the sort of the weaves of modern technology. They had this intuitive sense that Arduino, for example, was going to be, was going to be the right platform. Uh, second of all, the completely fearless. He, he bought pick and place machines on eBay and downloaded the manual because no one told him he couldn't. Permissionless innovation. And it's just like, he, you know, he, he didn't know that you're not supposed to start an aerospace company, you know, when, you know, when in a garage, but he just, he just did it. And thirdly, because he was in Tijuana, now it may not be obvious uh, to you in Europe, but Tijuana is like the Shenzhen of North America. You think of it as being drugs and tequila and danger, but it's not. It's actually the, the, uh, the electronics manufacturing center of North America. Almost all the screens are made there. And if you grow up in Tijuana, um, oh, by the way, it's totally safe now. And um, it's, it, it is actually totally safe. Um, Juarez, not so much. But, but Tijuana is, is safe. And if you grow up in Tijuana, building factories is just something you do. It's in the water, quite literally. Um, uh, anyway, so I met him, um, and, uh, and he was awesome. And I said, you know, I think I'm going to have to quit my company, and uh, quit, quit Wired, rather. And, and make this my full-time job. So, um, so we went and raised venture capital. And I can tell you, it, it is a, it is a, when you walk into a venture capitalist and you say, I, um, I'd, like to, I'd like some money, please, to start a, uh, you know, a, a drone company. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you say, oh, by the way, we already started the drone company. Um, we're going to do $7 million in revenues this year. We already sell more drones than all of America's aerospace companies combined. And we haven't taken a penny of venture capital yet. It's a much easier sell. <laughs> we basically accidentally de-risk the company by doing it via community, via this kind of grassroots innovation, been working and having a, a kid from Tijuana who just knew how to scale. So, um, so uh, we, we raised a lot of money.